Ladies and gentlemen, now is your opportunity. Um, we should be passing out the sheets of papers. Any question that you have, please uh, address it to either um, the Reverend Jimmy Swaggart or Brother Ahmed Didat. Ahmed Didat. Does the glorious Quran exist in its original and pure form? And were the originals, in fact, burned? There is an Osmani Quran. You know, and the Khalifa Osman. Brother Swagat mentioned something about variant readings. <coughs> that Osman had those variant readings burned. And uh, to give an example from his own speech, if somebody was shorthand, Right, you know, taking down notes of Brother Swaggart's speech, he mentioned a number of names. He was actually mutilating them. We forgive him because when it's an Ottoman or something like that, when it's saying Usman, he said something about Omar, which sounds most horrible. We are not taking you know, exception to that because this is, you are not used to the, our names. But the person who's taking shorthand, and you reproduce that, you'll never be able to connect that you were talking about Osman, the third caliph of Islam, or you're taking about, talking about Omar, the second caliph of Islam, Hafsa, you pronounce it correctly. So in that case, if I was going through the notes for publication, Brother Swaggart's speech, I would, you expect me to leave it as it is? You know what, the way mutilated spelling of Ottoman, this is not Ottoman, it's Usman, so I would say my O-T-H-M-A-N instead of Othman. I said, look, it's O-S-M-A-N, Osman. Wouldn't I do that? So what happened is this. The books, the Hebrew scripture as well as the Arabic scripture were written originally without the vowel points, without the vowels. Hebrew without vowels, Arabic without vowels. To a native of the language, it was quite easy to understand what was being said. But to an outsider, Without the vowels, you can't make the proper pronunciation. Like, for example, in English, if it was written without vowels, that the man is sleeping on the bed. The bed will be written B, D. You know it should be bed. It's not bid, it's not bod, it's not bad, it's not bud. B, D stands for bed. You know, your senses of the language makes you to substitute the vowels in your mind. B, D stands short for bed. The Arab knew that and the Jew knew that about his language. But as soon as he goes to a foreign nation, the person doesn't know how to pronounce like the word Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, which means praise be to God, the cherisher and sustainer of the world, written without vowels, how are you going to pronounce? Alhamdo, Ilhamdo, Alhamdo, how? So different nations, as soon as they started accepting Islam, the way they heard it, they started pronouncing it, they started writing it, mutilating the language. Like English, some of my people, they pronounce divorce as divorce, divorce as divorce, iron as iron. What are you going to do? I was spelling between the English of the Englishman and the English of the American, your spelling varies, but fortunately this sound, the pronunciation is not varying. But if that produces a separate a difference in, in the pronunciation, you say no, you'll have to change it. So. Those variant readings of the various pronunciations, they said, look, this le the revelation was given in the dialect of the Quraysh, the family, the tribe of Muhammad, and that pronunciation should be uh, preserved. So every other pronunciation 
with different vowel points, it says eliminate them. And that one that was done by Osman is preserved in the museum, in the top copy museum in Istanbul, that is in Turkey. Brother Swaggart, is this live? Please explain to me how in Revelation there are supposed to be 144,000 people who are supposed to enter heaven and all of them are Jews from the 12 tribes. What happens to the Gentiles like us? Is that your question? The 144,000 as mentioned in the book of Revelation, as the brother said, has to do with the Jewish people. 12,000 from each tribe has nothing to do with Gentiles. And those 12,000 are chosen from each tribe during the great tribulation period because they are the ones that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And so they are raptured up, in, up into heaven. It has nothing to do with the salvation of the millions that have come to the Lord. It has nothing to do with the Gentiles. It just speaks of that 144,000. And uh, it also states that whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So any Gentile that would call on the name of the Lord will be saved as well. I trust that answers the question. Brother Ahmed, Jesus said, the Lord our God is one, is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord with your God with all your heart. Mark 12, chapter the 29th through the 30th verse. Muslims agree with Christians that there is uh, only one God, but how do Muslims love God without a change of heart? The change of heart, look at the Muslims. Look at that. Jesus said, by the fruits you shall know them. Do men get a fix from the thistle or grace from the thorn? He said, every good tree will be a good fruit and every evil tree will be evil fruit. Here is the test. The fruits. Islam has created the biggest society of teetotalers in the world. There are some 1,000 million Muslims in the world and almost as a whole, they are teetotalers. They don't imbibe alcohol. Here is the fruit. My own particular race, the most racist people on earth, you know, the Hindus of India, the, 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 the caste Hindus, you know, the, 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 the super Brahmin caste, my nation. And you see the same nation, the most racist nation on earth, becomes one who accepts the black and the white, the rich and the poor in his brotherhood. A change. With all these claims that are being made for Christianity, Jesus Christ transforming people's lives, you know, the, the old you goes out of you and the new you comes into you. I said, my dear brothers and sisters, look, in this mighty nation of America, according to Brother Swaggart, 11 million drunkards. That's what he says. 11 million drunkards and 44 million heavy drinkers. Your nation. And Brother Swaggart says, I see no difference between them means 55 million. He considers them to be drunkards. The only difference is that he is not going far enough. In Islam, we say even your social drinker. The Holy Quran says, but before that the Prophet Muhammad said, so whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. No excuse for a nip or a tot. Out. The Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, so all you who believe, innam al khamru, most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru and gambling. Brother Swagat in his book on gambling says, 54 billion a year you are squandering on gambling. Wal maisiru, wal ansabu and fortune telling, wal aslamu and idol worship, rizum min amal shaitan, are an abomination of Satan's handiwork, fachtanibuhu la allakum tuflihun. It's a shun such abomination that you may prosper. And wine barrels were emptied in the streets of Medina, never to be refilled. This is the fruit. This is the fruit of this teaching. With 2,000 years of preaching, look at it. You have these powers of miracle working. Christ gives life. He heals the sick. Muhammad couldn't. In the name of Muhammad, they couldn't do it. I says, my brothers, you don't read the scriptures. Jesus Christ, he said, for there shall arise many false Christs and false prophets who will show you great signs and wonders if it were possible to deceive the very elect. If false Christ can do that, 
if false Christ can perform miracles, if false prophets can perform miracles, then I says, is this a test of your faith? No. Then Jesus Christ tells those who are doing this miraculous work, He's telling you in the Gospel of St. Matthew that on that day, on the last day, on the day of judgment, he says, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name do many mighty works? In your name, in the name of Jesus, didn't you do all these things? Didn't we do all that? He said, yes. He said, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I said, yeah, explain. You. He won't tell the Jews, depart from me, foot sack, get away, I don't know you. He won't tell the Hindus, get away from me, or the atheists, get away from me. He will tell you. I want to know why. Why would he tell you? I don't even know you, get out. I says, look, these are not the test. John the Baptist, according to Jesus, one of the mightiest messengers of God, Jesus says, among those born of women, there has not risen another greater than John the Baptist. And yet he performed no miracles. Did he? Show me, what did he do? What miracles? No, miracle is not a test. The, but the greater miracle is that without any miracles you transform nations. Nations are transformed. One thousand million people, they don't imbibe alcohol because of the dictates of Muhammad. <laughs> Mr. Swagger, what will happen to Muslims who believe in Jesus but do not receive him as Lord, as the Son of God, when they die. The Bible tells us that there is none other salvation under heaven other than by the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing in Jesus, that he's a miracle worker, that he's a prophet, that he's a great teacher is not enough. You have to accept what he did at Calvary's cross for your soul to be saved. Man labors under a terrible bondage of sin as a result of the fall. Sin is not just an act that you commit. It's not even a force. It's a nature. You cannot control that nature by cutting off a man's hand. You have to get to his heart. If all the Muslims in the world are thrilled and happy with what they have, why do hundreds of thousands of them watch my telecast? <laughs> Secondly, true Christians don't drink either. What mankind must have is a change of heart. You don't deal it from the exterior. It comes from the inside. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Not, not drinking alcohol is not enough. Just not gambling is not enough. Just keeping rules is not enough. Christianity is really not a religion. It's not a series of do's and don'ts. You cannot earn your salvation. He paid it at Calvary's cross totally and completely. We accept him. And then the nature of sin is broken. The person does not drink because he fears his hand will be cut off. Or his toes or his nose or whatever. But he doesn't drink because the desire is taken away. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and the gospel is to the whole world, not to just a select few, for God so loved the world. And incidentally, the word begotten also means to produce, sir. God produced his son. Ahmadida. <laughs> Ahmed Dida, does the glorious Quran state that the Holy Injil is guidance for all mankind? No, the Holy Quran doesn't say that the Injil is a guidance for mankind. Nor does the Bible say that. 
You see, Jesus Christ, when he sent out his disciples on the mission of preaching and healing, he instructed them. He said, go ye not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go ye rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want to know where the American Anglo-Saxons fit in as the Jews, the house of Israel. Then he's telling a Jewish woman, a Greek woman comes to him, wanting her daughter to be healed. So he turns his face away. She goes on the other side and she won't let him go. So the disciples say, help her, this woman is persistent. You know, like a drowning man clutching at straws, drowning women do the same. Heal her child. So Jesus says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews. So they say, help her. Jesus says, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. Who are the dogs? The Gentiles, you and me. Every other human being other than the Jews are dogs and pigs, according to Jesus, or according to your scripture. It says, Jesus says, do not throw that which is holy into dogs. Do not throw pearls before swine, lest they turn and rend you. Who are the dogs and who are the swine? The Gentiles. So he says, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. The woman in desperation, her child's life is at stake. She says, Lord, Master, even the dogs have crumbs from the Master's table. So he said, give her the crumbs. Look, this is the scripture. Unfortunately, the scripture is not being quoted. The scripture quotes what Jesus said. I'd like to hear what Jesus said. Jesus says, not about this supposed idea that you just believe and you'll be saved. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. And I'm asking, how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? You answer that. Mr. Swaggart, from Mr. Didat's proof that the Bible you hold in your hand is not God's word, what proof can you prove that he's wrong? I mean proof, not just belief. I believe I have proven it beyond the shadow of a doubt tonight that the Word of God is true. And I don't know what more proof that anyone would need. You can read the Bible and not believe it, but the Lord told us to believe it, and we would receive its many, many benefits. If one does not want to believe, irrespective of the proof that, proof that is shown, one still will not believe. The Lord said to one particular individual, if one came back from the dead, he was telling the story there in the 16th chapter of Luke, and the rich man said, send someone from the dead to warn my brothers. If one came from the dead, he wouldn't believe it if he doesn't believe the prophets that are already there. So there is no proof that one can give for unbelief because it will not believe. That's a reason that he said, and I once again quote my favorite verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I'll, I'll close with one more statement. Sir, I am proof that this is real, for he has saved my soul. Ahmed Didad, could you quote and give the reference from the glorious Quran stating the holy angel has been corrupted. And if not, then tell us when it was corrupted, by whom, and where exactly is it changed? Mr. Chairman and my dear brethren, you see, I started this talk of mine with some incantation, some recitation. I was not trying to mesmerize or hypnotize you. 
I was actually uttering the words from the Quran, instructing us, telling us, informing us that the scriptures that the Christians are talking about, the Bible, is their own creation. I repeat what I had said, I read and I'll give you the translation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِهِمْ Said woe to them who write the book with their own hands, then say this is from God. فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمَنًا كَلِيلًا That they may benefit from it some small reward. Like that 15 million dollars net profit they made on the RSV. Fifteen million is very small compared to eternity, in, compared to God's, you know, goodness, His salvation is nothing. Fifteen million. So, wawailul lahum mimma katabat aydihim. So, woe to them what their hands do write. Wawailul lahum mimma yaksibun. And woe to them for what they earn. In other words, I was proving to you all along. Actually, I was giving you all a commentary on that Quranic verse without going into details because I knew time was at a, very, at a premium. Originally, we had agreed to a format of an hour each and for some mysterious reason, I was robbed of 40, 20 minutes, so I had to cut short everything. I have so much more to give, which I'm now reserving for tomorrow night. So the thing is this now, this was actually a commentary of this situation that this book is written with their own hands, you add in and you take out, you add in and you delete. Look, this is proof enough, the books that you have in your hand is a proof that the books have been changed, you have been changing them. And out of the 24,000 manuscripts, I said no two are identical, that's a challenge. No two of those manuscripts are identical. Mr. Swaggart, is there anywhere in the Old Testament that says that Prophet Muhammad will come after Jesus? Thank you. Most every religion tries to find the Bible and somewhere in their teachings and their beliefs. And so does the Quran. It tries to say that it is mentioned in the Bible or Muhammad is mentioned in the Bible but uh, Mohammed is not mentioned in the Old Testament. I know you're referring to the book of Deuteronomy, but he's not mentioned. That passage is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ totally and completely. Mohammed is not mentioned anywhere from Genesis to Revelation, period. <laughs> Ahmed. What do Muslims have to say about the fact that people are healed in Jesus' name? I have no hesitation in accepting this phenomenon, that it can happen. But these things are happening in Hinduism. People are performing miracles. In Islam, people are performing miracles. You see, in the name of a false god, you can perform miracles. Jesus Christ told that woman, if you remember, you know, the woman who had a bleeding sickness issues, seven years, no healing, and she, while Jesus was passing by, she touched the helm of his garments and she was instantly healed. And Jesus felt that something was being drawn out of him. He looks at the woman, he says, Woman, it is thy faith that healeth thee. Her faith, that she had the faith that Jesus, by touching him she get healed, is your faith. So in other words, a faith in a false God can also perform miracles. Jesus says so. For there shall arise many false prophets and false Christs, who will show you great signs and wonders. If it were possible to deceive the very elect, even the disciples of Jesus can be deceived with such miracles. So miracles is no proof at all whether the person is genuine or not. <laughs> Mr. Jimmy Swaggart, why didn't the Old Testament mention that Jesus is the Son of God? If yes, read it to me, please. In Isaiah, 
chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. Thank you, sir. Ahmed Didan, who would deny that if God has preserved his word, the Torah, etc., and the Holy Angel in the past, he is able to preserve it always? What I was proving the whole night is that the books have not been preserved. See, so now you are begging the question. The books have not been preserved. If it were preserved, it would be worthy of recognition. I said, what is preserved there? The things that are there have created all the mischief. The type of book that you read as a pornography, I said, read it. My brother, look, he had 10 minutes. He had enough, more than enough time to read that, that little chapter of Ezekiel. I said, I dare anybody to read it to his congregation. And I tell you, I dare you, you will not read it. Reason? Because it is not the word of God. If it was the word of God, you would not be ashamed of it. If God Almighty was not ashamed to reveal the details of the whoredoms of those two sisters, I am asking why should you be ashamed? Are you holier than God? That's the implication. You are so holy that you dare not utter the words, but God Almighty uttered it. You are holier than God? I says, no. The thing is, it is not from God. See, the scriptures have been changed, and the Torah we are speaking about is not the Old Testament. You are telling us that the Bible was written by 40 different authors. Look, 40 different people wrote the book. We say when we believe, say we believe in the Torah, means the revelation that God gave to Moses. He didn't send a book down. Brother Swagat admits that the only thing that was written by God was those tablets, and those tablets Moses destroyed them. He threw them and they broke them to pieces. These are the five books. If they were written on tablets of stone, you would need a skyscraper-sized museum to hold those stones. Where did Moses keep them? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Where did he keep them? Those tablets of stones. No. He said, these are not the books of Moses. Moses would have no reason to belittle his brother prophet, Lot, that he committed incest with his daughters. What for? That Reuben, one of the sons of Jacob, committed incest with his mother. What for? The Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we get the word Judah, from whom we get the word Judaism, that he had prohibited with his daughter-in-law by the roadside while he was on his way to Timnath. He sees this woman sitting by the wayside and you know he goes up to her and he says, allow me to come in unto thee. She said, what will thou give me? And he said, I'll give you a kid from the flock. So what guarantee that I will give it? He says, I'll give, he says, what, what guarantee do you want? He says, your signet and your bracelet and your staff. And the old man gave it to her and he prohibited with his daughter-in-law and beget twins, Faris and Zara. And they are put now in the genealogy of Jesus. That they are the great, these children of incest are the great grandfathers of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It says, and this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The son of Abraham, the son of David, and Abraham being an Isaac, and Isaac became Jacob, and Jacob became Judas and his brethren, and Judas became Phares and Zara of Tamar. Who are these? Look at the cross reference. It tells you Genesis chapter 38, and you find that this is the father in law prohibiting with his daughter in law, who this is the children of incest, and they are honored to become the great grandfathers of Jesus Christ. I want to know, how does this come into the book of God? How does this come into the genealogy of a man who had no genealogy? Well, Mr. Swagger, please address the request of Dr. Didet to read certain passages from the Bible. I assume you mean the passages that um, Brother Ahmed, did that challenge you to read in his uh, presentation. <laughs> Mr. Didat has the uh, 
problem of answering questions that never were asked. Amen. Ezekiel 23, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed, and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. And the names of them were Ohola the elder, and Ohalaba her sister, and they were mine, and they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem Aholaba. And Ahola played the harlot when she was nine, and she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed with blue captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. Thus she committed her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols she defiled her set. Neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt, for in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the breast of her virginity, and poured their whoredom upon her. Wherefore I have delivered her into the hands of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians, unto whom she doted. These discovered her nakedness, they took her sons and her daughters, they slew her with a sword, and she became famous among women, for they had executed judgment upon her. And when her sister Aholaba saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she, and in her whoredoms more than her sister in her whoredoms. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way, and that she increased her whoredom. So when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look to after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. How much more do you want me to go? All the way? No, wait, no, wait, wait a minute. Huh? Verse 19. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms, and calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt, for she doted upon their paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and whose issues like the issue of horses. You want me to keep reading? I think that's enough. Okay, wait a minute. All my hundred dollars now. Amen. <laughs> All Muslims are truthful. Here's the hundred dollars. That man's got a pocket full of money. <laughs> if he takes all that money back to South, if he takes all that money back to South Africa, he's going to worsen the U.S. debt. <laughs> I don't know what kind of um, programs you have here in Islam, but I'm going to give his hundred dollars to whatever you have here to help pay for this auditorium tonight. Mr. Didak, you made a statement that Islam believes in the virgin birth of Christ, but does not, uh, that the, but, but that God does not beget nor is he begotten. Luke, the first chapter, the 34th and the 35th verse, explains the birth of Christ as the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary and the power of the Most High pouring upon her. How do you explain this? You see, Brother Swaggart has suggested uh, during his talk that the Quran is a copy, a plagiarism of stories from the Bible. Now, this, let me give you this example here. A comparison between what is told in the scriptures and what is told in the Quran about the birth of Jesus, if I may. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Wa is qalatil malaikat ya Maryamu. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki, wa taharaki, wa tafaki ala nisail alamin. That God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. This is the honor that is given to Mary, the mother of Jesus in the Holy Quran, that she is a woman chosen above the women of all nations. 
يا مريم مقنوتي لربك واسجدي واركعي مع الراقعين so oh Mary worship thy Lord devoutly prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down ذلك من أنباء الغيب نوحيه إليك this is part of the tidings of the things unseen which we reveal unto thee O Muhammad by inspiration you were not with them when they cast lots with arrows as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary nor was thou with them when they disputed the point I will not go into the full story, but if I may, I will have to do it tomorrow night. But the verses continue. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu? Behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah you bashiruki bi kalimatin minhu. That God Almighty gives you glad tidings of a word from Him. Is muhul masih? His name will be the Messiah, translated Christ. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, wajihan fi dunya wal akhirah, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. Wa min al muqarrabin, and of the company of those nearest to God. What the Christian would say, sitting on the right hand of God. We say not physically, not geographically, but in stature, in spirituality, in the company of those nearest to God. Wa yukallim un nasa. And he will speak to the people. Fil mahdi wa kahlan in in childhood and in maturity. Wa min al salihin, and he shall be of the company of the righteous. When this good news is given to Mary about the birth of a holy son, she says, "Qalat Rabbi anna yakunu li waladun, walam yamsasni bashar." She said, "Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me?" The angel says in reply, "Qala qadhalik Allahu yaqlubu ma yasha." So even so, Allah creates what He wills. وَإِذَا قَدَى أَمْرًا Whenever he decrees a matter فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ So whenever he decrees a matter he merely says to it be and it is. This is the Muslim concept of the birth of Jesus. For God to create a Jesus without a human father just like that. To, kill, to create a million Jesuses without father, without mother just like that. The biblical version in comparison I am suggesting to Reverend Dankers, the head of the Bible Society in Johannesburg. I had gone there to buy an Indonesian Bible in Johannesburg and he called me for tea, seeing this funny headgear of mine and this beard, that I was interested in Bibles. He called me into his office and I explained this to him, which was something novel to him, something amazing to him, that I was speaking from my book. So he said, look, this and the Bible appears to me to be the same. I said, yes, on the face of it. On the face of it, we are both trying to say the same thing. That Jesus was created by a special miracle. But I said, when you compare them closely, the difference between the Quran and the Bible is chalk and cheese. I don't know whether the Americans understand this expression, chalk and cheese. The Canadians didn't because they didn't know chalk, they knew crayon, crayon and cheese. Which is not the same thing. Chalk and cheese is poles apart, wools apart. The Quran says for God to create, he merely wills it and the thing comes into being. The Bible says, and the Holy Ghost with the same question, how can this thing be when no man, when no man has touched me? Or I know not a man, meaning sexually. The Bible says, and the Holy Ghost will come upon thee, and the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. This gives that picture to the atheist and the agnostic to beat you with. How did the Holy Ghost come on Mary? How did the Almighty overshadow her? Like a man doing to his wife? How? No, we know it doesn't mean that. But the language of the two, See, the Quranic language is for God to create, He wills it, and the thing comes into being. The biblical language is earthly. I said, between the two, I'm asking Reverend Dankers, which version would you be prepared to give to your daughter? The Quranic version of the birth of Jesus or the biblical version? And believe me, he bowed his, down, his head in shame, and he said, I would prefer to give the Quranic version to my daughter. Brother Swaggart. What did you mean by the term unique? After I answer this, I propose, if it's not out of order, that we make this the last question. We've been here two and a half hours. Oh, I'm sorry. Very good. Fine. Um, they're paying him by the hour. They're not paying me at all. <laughs> but I got $100, though. <laughs> In the Greek translation, in the, let me change it, in the original Greek, the word unique simply meaning different than any that there had ever been. 
There has never been one like the Son of God. He's unique. And there has never been one like Mary that produced the Son of God, as he eloquently explained just a moment ago. It just simply means there was never one before him like that. There will never be one after him like that. He was unique as God's own son manifest in the flesh. And incidentally, we Christians don't believe in three gods. We don't believe that God is married and lives in an apartment in heaven and has a bunch of children. We don't believe and teach such foolishness as that. We believe that out of love, God Almighty con condescended to come down here on this planet and live among men and to walk and talk among men and in human form, the incarnation to die on Calvary's cross as the perfect sin offering for mankind. Man helpless to save himself. And he did just that. And he told the people, you kill this body and in three days I will raise it up again. Once again, he was unique in that. He was unique in, his, in the prophecies. He was unique in his birth. He was unique in his life. He was unique in his miracles. He was unique in his ministry. He was unique in his death. He was unique in his resurrection. He was unique in his ascension. And when he comes back, he will be unique in his coming again. Mr. d -Day, we have invited you to our Christian nation to debate the topic, is the Bible the word of God? Will you now show the courage to invite Reverend Swaggart to debate you once again on the same topic in the city of Mecca? And if not, why? Mecca. You see, if the questioner had asked, are you prepared to debate Brother Swaggart in the United States in the different cities? I said, I'm prepared now to offer $10,000 for each meeting in places like the Madison Square Garden in New York, venues of that kind, $10,000 per meeting, four meetings in the United States, $40,000. But the questioner is asking whether I would be prepared to invite him to Mecca. Now, I don't rule Mecca, number one. Number two, if you want to get into Mecca, you need a visa. When I had to come to the United States, your government forced me to get a visa. And I went through the process of acquiring that visa, and I'm here. You see, I wanted to get, go to the old Zambia. You know, when Zambia became independent, I wanted to go to Zambia. At that time, Smith was ruling this south, southern Rhodesia. So they gave me visa forms, and I had to sign at the back that I do not recognize the illegitimate Smith regime before they'll give me a visa. I had to, I wanted to go, so I had to sign the document that I do not recognize the illegitimate Smith regime in southern Rhodesia. Say, similarly, if I have to come to the United States, I, feel, I fulfill your terms and conditions. Whatever you tell me, if I'm prepared to go through with it, I get the visa. Without that, no visa in Canada, no visa here, no visa for people in South Africa. You have to fulfill the conditions. Now there is a condition attached to you visiting Mecca. And that condition is that you declare with your lips, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. The meaning is, the meaning is that I believe that there is but one God, not Father, Son and Holy Ghost, not Jesus that God. I believe in the one and only God, Allah, which is his name. And that Muhammad is the last and final messenger of God. You feel that condition, you are welcome to come to Mecca. Mr. Swagger. Mr. Swaggart, according to your argument, the King James Version of the Holy Bible is necessary for salvation. Can we then surmise that anyone 
who uses Bible or another Bible will burn in hell, such as Muslims, Buddhists, Catholics, Jews, etc. I have never said, never believed that you have to believe in the King James Version to be saved. That's foolishness. That's silly. And before I answer the question, if you won't let me come to Mecca, let me go on television over there. (laughs) Mr. D. Dot mentioned the Douay version of the Bible. Sir, we do believe in the Douay version of the Bible. Translation, let's put it that way. We do not accept those spurious books that were mentioned, but we do believe in the Douay translation. We feel it's a good translation. No one has to believe in a particular translation of the Bible to be saved. You do have to believe in the Word of God to be saved. And once again, the Word of God says, there is none other name under heaven. It also tells us that we are saved by faith not by works, lest any man should boast. We're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't care where that word is. If the word of God, do you have a Quran over there, sir? Could I? I mean, I was hoping he brought one. (laughs) Okay. Any word of God that's in this book, If you believe it pertaining to salvation, you will be saved. You follow what I'm saying? If the word of God pertaining to salvation, pertaining to being redeemed, pertaining to being saved, if it's written on the side of a wall somewhere, to be frank with you, it's written on our hearts. That's what the Bible tells us. You can... Memorize this book and worship it, and it won't save you. It has no power to save you. But the Word of God, if adhered to, and that means accepting Jesus Christ as one's own personal Savior. If that is in the Quran, you can be saved. Mr. D. Dad. How does the Muslim account for different versions of the Qur'an? Does this make all of the versions um, lies as you claim the Bible is? I repeat, there is no such thing as different versions of the Qur'an. I said there are translations. Yours are versions. Brother Swaggart, in the previous question he uh, answered, he said, look, there are seven spurious books in the Dua version. Seven spurious means which he rejects. So it's a version. There are seven books out of this which he is not prepared to accept as the word of God. Whereas every Quran in the world translated as a, it is God's word translated. And you have a choice of words, but they are not versions. This is a version. This is a version. Chunks and chunks are thrown out from what is in here. Different version. I hope you understand my English. You know, I don't know how, how, how simpler I can put it to you. That the things are varying. What is in here? Seven books? Not in here. What is in here is not in there. What is in here is taken out from there again. Can you see? It's a version. I hope. I don't know. Reverend Jimmy Swaggart, what is Trinity? We believe the Word of God teaches that there is one God, not 2, 5, 10, 12, 15, one, manifest in three persons, three different personalities. We believe there is a Heavenly Father, we believe there is God the Son, and we believe the Holy Ghost, as Mr. D. Dot mentioned, that came upon Mary, is also God. They are indivisible meaning they agree perfectly. They are one in unity. They never disagree. They never have disagreed. We believe that when you get to heaven, if you get there, Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God, will be seated according to the word of God by the right hand of the Father and will actually maintain that throne forever, basically. That's what we mean by the Trinity in a short nutshell. We have a time exactly for two more questions. Mr. Didak, do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Why or why not? You see, the idea of the Holy Ghost in Christendom is that he is one in a trinity. But the Christian says that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. In his catechism, he continues that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues, your catechism. It says the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. That's what Brother Swagger says in his book. Person, person, person. But not three person, but one person. I am asking what language are you speaking? I'm asking, is that English? By God, it is gibberish, it's not English. <laughs> you see, you said person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, Brother Swagat, you and your two other brothers, let's say you are three identical triplets, and we can't make the difference out between the three of you. They're all identical. We can't make out the difference. If one of you commit murder, can we hang the other? You say no. I'm asking why not? So you tell me that he's a different person. I said, right. What makes him different? His personality. So the father, you know, imagination, the human mind, you can't help. When you use words, they conjure up mental pictures. When you say in the name of the father, you have a certain mental picture of that old father Christmas, Santa Claus, millions and millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man sitting on some planet with his feet dangling onto the earth as his footstool, the heaven as his canopy, the loving father in heaven. When you say God the son, I'm asking, are you thinking of a prize bull or a false one? No. You're thinking of a handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features. Something like what you saw in the King of Kings, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, uh, on the day of Triumph, where Jeffrey Hunter was acting. You know, handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features, nice beard, not with a poly nose, with a crooked nose. That might make other pictures come into your mind. You know, Shakespeare made Shylock famous. It's a Shylock, Shylock, no. You see, so you're thinking of somebody like an Englishman or a Nordic or a German type with a straight nose, the sun. And the Holy Ghost, something that came like a dove when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist or something that came in flames of fire at Pentecost. I said, the picture is not very vivid, but the picture is there. You have three distinct mental pictures. And howsoever hard you try, you can never superimpose those three pictures and create one. There will ever be three in your mind. But when I ask you how many pictures you see, you say one, you are lying to me. Brothers and sisters, you are lying to me. Actually, we have about three minutes. Mr. Swaggart, this uh, question is from the management. Do you give us permission to everyone interested in obtaining a copy of this event? Um, number one. Number two. Why didn't you allow televising this event? And number three, we have offered this opportunity to televise this event in Mecca, but it was refused. Shame on you, you did misquote me. I did not say that God is a person, the Son is a person, the Holy Ghost is a person, and they are one person. I didn't say that. I said there is one God, not one person. Uh, it seems to me they're televising it. I see one, two, three, four, five cameras. You said they're not televising it? They're televising it, aren't they? 
I'm, I'm a little confused. I don't understand. Do you give us permission uh, for everyone interested in obtaining a copy of, of this event? Video? Yes, we will certainly do that, providing that you do not edit the tapes. You see, I know a little bit about television, and you can make anyone say just about anything you want them to say by chopping it up. We are experts at that, Mr. D. Dad. And uh, I would trust this man. Are you looking at me, sir? I trust you. But I don't trust the whole world that I do not see. And we ask to sign a statement if you wanted to televise it and take it with you, do whatever you want to do with it, providing that you tell us where you are going to edit it and how you're going to cut it up. I think that's only fair. We would not want to take anything he said and chop it up and make him to seem to say something that he did not say. That wouldn't be right nor fair. And I think that we've been just about as Christian as anyone could ever be with it. <laughs> I want to say something just before we get started. I have not known too very much about Islam. I do not say that with any type of pride, but I have to be honest. In the last few months, I have studied Islam somewhat, and I'll admit I've only scratched the surface. Back some, I guess it must have been about two years ago now, I made a derogatory statement over television about the Quran. If you were not listening that particular week, I'm never going to tell you what it was. I wonder if it's ever been explained how many passages in the Quran, and it, it is a beautiful book. Literarily, it's unequal. But how many stories were plagiarized from Jewish fables and folklore? I wonder. And he said he prayed in the name of Mohammed come out of him. I ask you, what happened? Nothing. He prayed several times in the name of Mohammed, come out of it. But I remind you as I close this, a dead man cannot produce miracles. I want to say it again, a dead man cannot produce miracles. Jesus Christ is alive. I want to look for a moment at the alleged contradictions or variations found in the Word of God. And from this, I want to prove to you that this is the Word. In 2 Samuel 24 and 4 and 1 Chronicles 21 and 1, it mentions that God provoked David, 2 Samuel. Satan provoked David, 1 Chronicles. It seems like a contradiction. 
Of course, anyone that studies the Word of God knows that God is said to do things oftentimes that He only allows to be done. To be honest with you, there's evidence in the Quran that the same thing was done by God. I want to say that again. There's no contradiction here. God oftentimes, in the Old Testament especially, is placed in a position of being responsible for something when He only allows it to be done. And in reality, He is responsible in effect when you think of that. In an explanation about the contradictions in the Bible, whether Satan provoked David or the Lord provoked David, he said, look, this is we attribute it to God. That though the devil did it, we say God did it. On that basis, would we be prepared to concede that God had those six million Jews incinerated because Hitler did it? We say because God intended it. This is what he wanted to do. So God is responsible for the massacre or the incineration of six million Jews or even 600,000 or even 6,000 is dramatic enough. If, they, if Hitler did it, who do you say God did it? Are you going to blame God for that? You're going to exonerate Hitler and the Nazi party because you said God did it? No, dear brother Swagat, we don't think like that. If a criminal does such and such a thing, we say it is his action, he's responsible. We don't say God did it. Because eventually the power comes from God, but God has given you that free will to think and, and to see right from wrong. So if you do wrong, you are responsible. You can't hold God responsible. So either David was provoked by the Satan or by the Lord. And Satan and Lord are not synonymous terms in any religion. They are opposites. Satan and the God Almighty are opposite things. In 1 Kings 4 and 26, it speaks of 40,000 stalls, Solomon's grandeur. 2 Chronicles 9, 25, 4,000 stalls re relating the same incident. And we would have to think, isn't that a contradiction? It is. Plain, pure, and simple. It relates the same story. There are several incidents in the Word of God stating the same identical thing in various different ways where one account will be given and the number will be slightly changed. Another account will be given, it'll say 2,000, and then Second Chronicles or First Chronicles 3,000 or whatever. In any book claiming to be from God, that book will be free from contradictions. Like for example... The example the brother gave, I repeat that. I said, look, it says in one of the books, Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horses. Another one says he had 40,000 stalls of horses. And 4 and 40 is only the difference of a zero. So you say, I said, you know, my cousins, the Jews, they didn't know the zero when they wrote the book. They didn't know. It's my Arab brothers who found it from my fathers in India and they shared it to the world, zero. The Jews didn't know. They wrote this in words. Four, F-O-U-R, four. In Hebrew, of course. Forty, F-O-R-T-Y, forty. I said, now who made the mistake? God or the writer? And they were not saved. We are told that they were not saved from mistakes. Mrs. Ellen G. White. You say she's a cultist, Mrs. Ellen G. White. The prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. She says in her Bible commentary, in her Bible commentary she says, she has no motive to lie. She believes in the Bible to be the inspired word of God. And yet she says, so the Bible we, have re we read today is the work of many copyists who have in most instances done the work with marvelous accuracy. In most instances, she, they have done their work with marvelous accuracy. But copies have not been infallible. And God, most, mo, and God most evidently has not seen fit to preserve them altogether from error. God didn't see fit. In other words, this is, this is his business. God's business. If he wants to see fit, if he wants to do a thing, he does it. If he doesn't, he says, go to hell. That's your business. So God didn't see fit to preserve them from making errors. 
in transcribing. In the following pages of her commentary, Mrs. White testifies further, I saw that God had specially guarded the Bible. God had specially guarded the Bible. I am asking for what? Yet, when copies of it were few, learned men had in some instances changed the words in the original manuscripts. They changed the words, thinking that they were making it plain, when in reality they were mystifying that which was plain, by causing it to lean to the established views which were governed by tradition, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have produced a translation called the New World Translation. The Orthodox, you don't accept that. Why don't you? Because they have their own leanings. According to their own ideas, they are changing the world. Same thing that the Protestants did. They were people who believed in Jesus as God. So they said, now, they changed the world. So we said, this is, has been going on from the very beginning. We believe that Moses wrote what is called the Pentateuch, those first five books, with the exception possibly of the last few verses in Deuteronomy. And he could have even written that because we believe that God, and I know Islam believes, that God is so powerful that he could have revealed to Moses exactly how he would die and exactly how that his funeral would be conducted. That would have been no problem for God. But whether he wrote it or whether Joshua wrote it, it was written about 3,500 years ago. The first five books, supposed to be the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These revisers, scholars of the highest eminence, they are telling us today that Moses didn't write the books. He didn't write the books. He's not the author. He's the author, Genesis, author, the first book of Moses in inverted commas. Exodus, second book of Moses in inverted commas. Leviticus, third book of Moses in inverted commas. Numbers, fourth book of Moses in inverted commas. Deuteronomy, fifth book of Moses in inverted commas. I'm asking why the inverted commas? What for? Why this inverted commas? They are telling you in a very, very diplomatic, psychological way that these are not our words, we don't believe so, but the common man, the laity, the preachers, the Bible thumpers, the hot gospelers, this is what they believe. That these are the books of Moses, but Moses didn't write them. We don't believe that these are his words, so we put them in inverted commas. It's not the book of Moses. There are more than 700 times in these five books you did the expression, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord. Neither the Lord said this, nor did Moses write it. English, this is your language. This is written in the third person. Not by God, not by Moses. If Moses wrote it, he would have said, the Lord said unto me, and I said unto the Lord. The Lord, I, or the Lord says, I said unto Moses, and Moses said unto me. This is in the third person, and that somebody else is writing about these things. It is not the word of God, it is not even the words of Moses. With regards to the obituary, I found out from Jewish scholars, Jewish prophets didn't write the obituaries. You know, before dying, he says, you know, on my tombstone, you put these words, epitaphs. Jewish didn't, didn't do that. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says, my brother admits that it could be the works of Joshua. But they're supposed to be the books of Moses. How does Joshua fit in? It says, and there Moses died in the land of Moab. Died in the past tense over against Beth Peer. And no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was, he was 120 years old when he died. Now, some mention about the many versions of the Bible. Really, that's an incorrect statement. There is only one version of the Bible. There are many translations. 
Our scholars argue constantly over varied translations. King James Version, as we use that term, as I've mentioned incorrectly, is really a translation. Others have been put out. They were critical of the King James. Even to the point of laboring incessantly to derive the Old Testament from the Hebrew in which it was written, minus a few verses in Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. Translation, some are incorrect, we think. I personally like the King James. And Brother Swagat has given us to understand that translations and versions are one and the same thing. We Muslims, we have a number of translations of the Quran even into the English language. Different people, Yusuf Ali, Mamidu Pikthol, you know, Darya Badi, and so on and on. We have English translations by different people. And there, the translation means a difference in the choice of words. Choice of words in translating a certain phrase from Arabic into English. Choice of words. Versions are quite a different thing. Look, here, I have in my hand this Bible, which Brother Swagat, as well as many Protestants, do not accept as the word of God. This is the Roman Catholic version of the Bible. The Douay or Reims version of the Bible. This Bible has 73 books. This is an encyclopedia of 73 books. Seven more than one which Brother Swagat takes oath on. The King James Version. This is the King James Version. He takes oath by it. In his Evangelist magazine, December 1985, somebody questions Brother Swagat about the Bible being the Word of God. And he says, Word of God, and in bracket, I refer to the King James Version. In your Evangelist of December 85, the King James Version. The King James Version has thrown out those seven extra books. Thrown out. In other words, those seven extra books the, Christ, the Protestants do not accept as the word of God. You use certain technical terms like, like apocrypha, which the masses of Christendom do not know. What is this apocrypha? Apocrypha means doubtful, weak, not deserve to be in the book of God. As such, the Protestants threw it out as a fabrication. These seven books are thrown out from here. So this version, the Christian Protestants will not accept as the word of God. Am I correct? This is not the word of God. So we put it aside. I agree with you. What you tell me, I accept. You say it's not the word of God. I say I agree with you and I put it aside. Now you tell me that this is the word of God. The King James Version. With the 66 books. This was first published in 1611. By order of His Majesty King James whose name is still based today. Authorized version, authorized by who? Not God Almighty, by King James. He authorized it. Not God Almighty. There are some 24,000 manuscripts of the Word of God, of the New Testament alone, I should say, that dates back before 350 A.D., the original statement or signature or autograph of the Word of God does not exist. As I mentioned, the first one was printed on vellum or, or clay tablets some 3,500 years ago. They perished from overuse and from being put on material that had little lasting quality, at least not that long. But at any rate... Some 24,000 copies have been made. And scholarship tells us 
when it concerns the ancient books of antiquity, if at least ten copies are in existence, you don't have to have the original to guarantee the origin. And when one considers that there are 24,000 copies and there are some variants in those copies, we admit. But basically the text is not changed. The boast about 24,000 manuscripts. Brother Swagat, you know, no two are identical. Your scholars say out of the 24,000 that you are boasting about, no two are identical. Then how do you come to know that this is the word of God and this is not out of the 24,000? On the very face of it, when you open the book, the Injil and the Torah you are talking about, this is Mark and um, Matthew begins. In your version, the King James Version, it says, the gospel according to St. Matthew, the gospel according to St. Mark, the gospel according to St. Luke, the gospel according to St. John. I am asking, what is this according, according, according? What is this according to? Why according to? I have got Brother Swagart's book. It says, the homosexuality, its cause and its cure by Jimmy Swagart or just Jimmy Swagart. It doesn't say according to Jimmy Swaggart. Why this in the book of God? According to, according to, according to, according to. You know why? Because Matthew didn't sign his name. Luke didn't sign his name. John didn't sign, Mark didn't sign his name. John didn't sign his name. These are assumed anonymous books. Anonymous books. Attributed to God. And the genealogy, and Matthew and Luke, and Matthew it gives Joseph's genealogy, and in Luke it gives Mary's genealogy. In the, the, the temple in Jerusalem, if there had been anything wrong with, I'm running out of time. there had been anything wrong with the genealogy of Christ, they would have pointed it out immediately, but they did not. The genealogy between Matthew and Luke, we are given 66 fathers and grandfathers to Jesus. In a genealogy of 66 fathers and grandfathers, except for one name, no two names are identical. Separate list, everyone is a different name. Brother Swaggart says, one is the genealogy of Mary and one of Jesus. I say, why of Mary? Does the book say that? No. The book says this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The other one ends with Jesus Christ. There's no Mary inside. 66 names, no two I like except one. And the father of Jesus Christ, allegedly, God Almighty, he is not there. Can you imagine? God Almighty dictating the genealogy of his son in inverted commas. And yet he leaves himself out. He is going out of his way to dictate two genealogies with 66 names and he is not in it. He is not there. I am asking what is he trying to tell you? What is he really trying to tell you? When his name is not there. A man who had no genealogy, we believe. No genealogy. He was born miraculously. Without any male intervention, you give him 66 fathers and grandfathers, and you say, This is God Almighty dictated. We Muslims, brothers like God, we take strong exception to this type of handling of this mighty messenger of God. The Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we get the word Judah, from whom we get the word Judaism, that he had prohibited with his daughter in law by the roadside while he was on his way to Timnath. He sees this woman sitting by the wayside. And you know, he goes up to her and he says, allow me to come in unto thee. She said, what will thou give me? And he said, I'll give you a kid from the flock. So what guarantee that thou will give it? He says, I'll give, he says, what, what guarantee do you want? He says, your signet and your bracelet and your staff. And the old man gave it to her and he prohibited with his daughter-in-law and beget twins, Faris and Zara. And they are put now in the genealogy of Jesus. That they are the great, these children of incest are the great grandfathers of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It says, and this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, and Abraham being an Isaac, and Isaac became Jacob, and Jacob became Judas and his brethren, and Judas became Phares and Zara of Tamar. Who 
are these? Look at the cross reference. It tells you Genesis chapter 38. And you find that this is the father-in-law prohibiting with his daughter-in-law. Who this is the children of incest. And they are honored to become the great grandfathers of Jesus Christ. I want to know how does this come into the book of God? How does this come into the genealogy of a man who had no genealogy? Unique in his ascension. The ascension. Brother Swaggart quotes in his book, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, another place, Mark chapter 16, verse 19. I say, it's not in my Bible. I didn't print this. The Jews didn't print it. The Hindus didn't print it. You Christians, you produced this book and you are telling me that this is the most up-to-date Bible, going to the most ancient manuscripts. So I look up for Ma Mark chapter 16, I see it ends at verse 8. 9 to 20 is missing. Did I take it out? The Muslims took it out? No. 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 covering de denominations, they thought it fit that this is another fabrication imposed upon Christendom. And they also threw it out. It's not in my Bible. Therefore, it is not the word of God. If this is the word of God, then that is not the word of God. But, I pick up another Bible. Look at this. Look at these two. Brother Swaga, identical. Look at that. I see back again. It's inside. What was thrown out? The ascension. There are only two places in, in the Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, there are only two places where ascension is mentioned. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. Luke chapter 24, verse 51. Thrown out of this version. Thrown out as fabrication. Ascension. And yet these Bibles, each and every one of them, they tell us that Jesus, when he went to Jerusalem, he rode the donkey into Jerusalem, Matthew says. Mark says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Luke says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. John says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. But God Almighty didn't miss that out. His son riding the donkey into Jerusalem. When every Tom, Dick and Harry was riding donkeys into Jerusalem. That he didn't forget. But the ascension is not mentioned not once. And where it is mentioned is now thrown out. But I buy another Bible, identical Bible. That's the look. Printed by the same printers. I look and it's there again. What was thrown out, they put it back again. How come? How come? What games are you people playing? Look at this. Back again. This is the 1971 version. Back again. The ordinary people, poor people, they don't know what's going on. What game is being played? Who knows? You read the preface. The learned man, the preacher, he reads the preface, but he won't tell his congregation what he's reading in the preface. In the preface we are told that individuals and two church denominations, they stampeded them, they forced them that they should put it back. If not, they're going to preach against this book to say, look, don't buy this, buy the King James Version. Don't buy this, buy the King James, the most up-to-date Bible going to the most ancient manuscripts. No, 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 don't touch that. This is the safer one, because it has everything that you want to preach, to catch the fish. It's easier to catch the fish with this than with this, the bait. You know, the fish, you know, uses, like Dale Carnegie, he tells us in his book, how to, uh, he says, how to win friends and inf influence people. He says, I like strawberry and cream. I think most Americans do. But he says, when I go fishing, I put a worm, worm to catch the fish. Not that I love worms, but this is what the fish loves. So I put worm. So now, if you want to catch fish, you've got to use the right bait. Ascension is now restored to the text, says the preface. Why? Not God told them so. God doesn't speak freely to those scholars, as freely as he happens to speak, as brother claims, with him. Now I want to start this out tonight by quoting a passage of scripture that 
Mr. Dedot and myself disagree somewhat over, but which is one of, if not the dearest, passage in the Word of God to the world of Christendom, found in St. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only unique Son. Who's you there, Mr. Dedot? His only unique Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want to use that as the basis for this simple statement that I would attempt to make tonight. Now, prepare for the shock. I said, prepare for the shock. From these 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they say, yet the King James Version has grave defects. And that these defects are so many and so serious. They are, these are not my words. They are, so, they are so many and so serious as to call for revision in the English translation. Call for revision. And they revised it. And in the revision, the kingpin of the evangelist, the preacher, the hot gospeler, the Bible thumper, John 3.16 no Christian preacher is worth the name if he can't clinch the deal with John 3.16. John 3.16. For God so loved the world in the authorized King James Version that he gave his only begotten son. My brother Swagger changed the word begotten to unique. This is not from the King James Version. The King James Version says begotten I heard Brother Swaggart on TV, or was it video? This morning, this morning, there he's speaking to a group as if it was his own church group, you know, giving some lessons on Babylon. I think it was on that or another one. He used the word begot this morning. And in eight hours' time, he changed it to unique. <laughs> I'm asking, are you ashamed of the word begot? Are you ashamed of it? That Jesus is the only begotten son? We believe the word of God teaches that there is one God. Not 2, 5, 10, 12, 15. One God. Manifest in three persons. Three different personalities. We believe there is a heavenly father. We believe there is... God the Son, and we believe the Holy Ghost, as Mr. D. Dot mentioned, that came upon Mary, is also God. They are indivisible, meaning they agree perfectly. They are one in unity. They never disagree. They never have disagreed. You see, the idea of the Holy Ghost in Christendom is that he is one in a trinity. But the Christian says that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. In his catechism, he continues that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues, your catechism. It says the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. That's what Brother Swagger says in his book. Person, person, person. But not three person, but one person. I am asking, what language are you speaking? I am asking, is that English? By God, it is gibberish, it is not English. You see, you said person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, Brother Swagat, you and your two other brothers, let's say you are three identical triplets. And we can't make the difference out between the three of you. They're all identical. We can't make out the difference. If one of you commit murder, can we hang the other? You say no. I'm asking why not? So you tell me that he's a different person. I said, right. What makes him different? His personality. So the father 
you know, imagination, the human mind, you can't help. When you use words, they conjure up mental pictures. When you say in the name of the Father, you have a certain mental picture of that old Father Christmas, Santa Claus, millions and millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man sitting on some planet with his feet dangling onto the earth as his footstool, the heaven as his canopy, the loving Father in heaven. When you say God the Son, I'm asking, are you thinking of a prize bull or a false one? No. You're thinking of a handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features. Something like what you saw in the King of Kings, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, uh, on the day of crime where Jeffrey Hunter was acting. Handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features, nice beard, not with a poly nose, with a crooked nose. That might make other pictures come into your mind. You know, Shakespeare made Shylock famous. Is it Shylock? Shylock? No. You see, so you're thinking of somebody like an Englishman or a Nordic or a German type with a straight nose, the sun. And the Holy Ghost, something that came like a dove when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist or something that came in flames of fire at Pentecost. I said, the picture is not very vivid, but the picture is there. You have three distinct mental pictures. And however hard you try, you can never superimpose those three pictures and create one. There will ever be three in your mind. But when I ask you how many pictures you see, you say one, you are lying to me. Brothers and sisters, you are lying to me. Prayed in the name of Mohammed, come out of him. I ask you, what happened? He prayed several times in the name of Mohammed. Come out of it. And I do not mean that disrespectfully of Mohammed. He could have prayed in the name of Abraham or Moses. And it would have done no better. He could have prayed in the name of Paul or Peter.